recording in progress. Well, as I said to Rima yesterday when I came in with my thumb drive so that we could look at all the beautiful spring bulbs in a little bit here, that the weather has was changing. And I forgot that was the equinox yesterday. It just oh, went yeah. right over my head. Yeah. Um, and this morning, I got up at about mm, six o'clock to let the cat out. And up on my hill outside of Alford, it was, um, let me think, about 39. And I was amazed an hour later, around the time the sun was coming up, it had dropped another three degrees. So it was down to about 36, 37. So I'm thinking I'm on the hilltop. And even though there was a light breeze last night, folks down in the valley might have got a touch of frost because if the atmosphere is fairly still and clear, the cold air sinks. And so if you live in a frost pocket, you might have had a touch of frost. And it was very clear last night. And it was very clear. Jupiter reigning clear. supreme up yeah. there. Yes, beautiful, beautiful Jupiter. Um, so it's time to start listening to the weather report. And hopefully you know how your particular place in the world is compared to the general weather report. Even with all this fancy whatever, we have microclimates. So Google may tell you whatever, but you may be two or three degrees different. So hopefully if you're a gardener of a few years experience, you know that when the Alfred Sun's reporter on the weather says, Alfred is gonna be 37 at night, I automatically subtract three degrees because up on the hill, it's always a little bit cooler, except for those rare times when it's a clear, night and the cold air is sinking down the hill. But normally the higher you go from the center of the earth, the cooler things get. Until of course you get to outer space and it's very, very cold, right? So you have to know your, where you are and pay attention to the weather report because you know how it goes. There's a frost and we're, we're approaching the average first frost, first of October coming up here in what? A week about. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. But it could happen anytime. But if you're willing to run out with your old sheets, <laughs> towels, boxes, and cover up certain things like your tomatoes, okay. my daughter's peppers, what else? Green beans. The other stuff is fairly hardy. You don't have to worry about it yet. But if you want to extend the season, do that. Just cover them up around five o'clock in the afternoon when things start cooling down. Um, leave the covers on until around eight or nine, 10 in the morning when things start to warm up a bit. Um, which, of course, means people who work, <clears throat> you have to train the dog to do this for you while you're not there. Um, you'd think they'd come up with automatic robot um, machines that would do it for you. Probably will. We could go into business, yes. make a lot of money. Yeah. All right. Have to come up with a good name. Most important thing. Um, yeah, not right now. So anyway, um, and then what happens is we have an extended, quite often, two, three beautiful weeks. It used to be called Indian summer. Mm -hmm. I resent that because the Indians, by and large, kept to their treaties. It was we who didn't. So it's like white people summer. <laughs> it's an extended frost-free season where, once again, your tomatoes can continue to grow, et cetera, if you saved them from that first frost uh -huh. it's up to you okay. some people don't want to bother but if you do then pay attention to your weather report that's number one number two you may have seen the advertisement maybe you haven't the master gardeners are going to do once again in the fall like we've been doing for years because fall is the time to do it do what rima <laughs> what are we doing tomorrow harvesting the pH clinic. Oh, sorry. Hey, yeah, we're doing both of those. We're doing both of those things. Okay. Yeah, you're right. She's harvesting her tomatoes and peppers and whatnot. Yes. Um, and may bring some soil down. The Tinkertown Hardware Store outside of Alfred, down by Alfred Station, every year now for years in the fall, um, gives us their space and their table and their chairs, and they're very helpful. <laughs> and we master gardeners hang out, and usually maybe a dozen people come. Tomorrow, 
Saturday, 11 to 1. Don't come early because we won't be set up <laughs> until 11 o'clock and we leave at 1 o'clock. Um, two samples are free. If you bring more, it's at least $3 each for the others. Depends on how big your garden is or how mm. different it is. Some gardens, it's all the same. Some people have different, their gardens are either in different places or they know that the soil is different in different parts of a big garden. Right, like our blueberries, that blueberry section is probably a higher. Um, well, and, and the blueberries also need a very um, low pH, very acidic soil above and beyond what's normal here. So you almost always have to add sulfur to lower the pH number. If you, But that's another topic for another day. So um, go get your soil sample and bring it down to the hardware store tomorrow between 11 and 1. And we'll be there to test your soil and answer most, some of your gardening questions. Can't always answer them all because we don't know all the answers. So that's tomorrow down at Tinkertown Hardware Store. Okay. Um, I've decided to switch the talk around because we have a PowerPoint on spring bulbs, plant now, bloom later. And I asked, I'm so glad we still have some classics. Now, can they see this if I hold it up like that? Yes. Okay. What's that? Oh, the tale of Peter Rabbit. <laughs> or we could have had Bambi. What, what was, was that a book or was that just the movie? That was, that is a book. That is a book. I believe it's written by Felix Salter. Oh, and they made the movie from the book. All right. When so we were, when we were all children and some of us still, <laughs> Farmer McGregor was the bad guy. And <laughs> yeah, really good old Peter Rabbit and Flopsy and Mopsy were the innocent heroes. <laughs> and so was Bambi, right? Well, once you grow up and become a gardener, I'm sorry, guys, we've all become pretty much Farmer McGregor because Mr. Peter is not a hero. He's a nuisance. And his big, his cousins, I say the red squirrels and the chipmunks are just as bad as Peter Rabbit. And then I say his uncle and aunts, the deer, are even worse. So we probably should have a program just on how to deal with all these creatures that we loved when we were children <laughs> and now have problems loving that we are gardeners. <laughs> and they're they're contending for our food. Mary Lou, have you ever yeah. chased a rabbit with your home? <laughs> True There's confession. A of Mr. McGregor doing that, so I'm just curious. My shovel. Really? Well, the cat, my cat is a great huntress. And fortunately, she hardly ever gets any birds, but she does control the the mice, the voles, the chipmunks to some extent, mm -hmm. the red squirrels to some extent. And I am lucky. I hardly ever have rabbits around. But yeah. one year. There, yeah, I don't know why. Maybe I've seen three or four rabbits in almost 40 years. So they're really not around. However, a few years ago, Sweetie caught um, a baby rabbit, probably not much bigger than a chipmunk. Yeah. Now, normally I believe in letting nature do its thing. But then again, I can't see a cat torturing well, they don't call it. That's a very judgmental term to use. They're hunters. They're the baby rabbits. They're prey. They eat it when they kill it, but they don't always kill it right away. And I can't deal with that. So when I became aware of the situation, I went out with my shovel, yelled at my cat. Who knows? Because this has happened more than once, like with the red squirrel or whatever. She steps back and I give it one good whack, put it out of its misery, and then she eats it. So yeah, I have, but I I forgot I haven't read this in years. He chased it with a hoe. Yeah, it's harder to hit with a hoe than the side of a shovel, guys. If so, if you're going to do it, use the flat of a shovel. I think what happened was Mr. McGregor was. Um, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, let's show. He was hoeing in his garden. Okay, here. let's. Here, yeah. yeah, you can hold it up so people can see. Yeah, here's Mr. McGregor chasing Peter with his hoe. Or is it a rake? Oh, it's a oh, rake. I think it's a rake. Yikes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. That's. Use a shovel if you have to do it, you know, if you have to do it. Yeah, it makes no good. No, no. 
Uh, so anyway, on that grim note, <laughs> now that everybody knows our secrets, <laughs> uh, which, now this is an aside. I'm appalled at what happens in Africa, say to the elephants. Mm -hmm. But I can also understand the farmers that live around the preserves. And when the elephant comes out and tramples their whole garden, And the problem, of course, is too many people. Mm -hmm. That that's the real problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting to the point where we can't share the world with anything because there's too many of us, and we need it all. Mm -hmm. So that's a moral dilemma. But we're not going to get into that either today. Okay, spring balls. Can we bring up the PowerPoint that we worked on the other day? Yes. It's, hmm. Where did my little mousey go? There it is. Okay. And by the way, once again, Rima does all the technical work for me. I grow the things and I babble away about them. But if it wasn't for Rima and sometimes Melanie, the other librarian, we wouldn't be doing this at all. Okay. Now, I these are all my bulbs from my garden. And I've done this program two or three times over the last, oh, I don't know, eight years or so. So anyway. Um, what I want to do first, as I usually do, before we look at all the pretty pictures, that's the reward for sitting through the lecture, <laughs> I have a few basic um, comments to make. And you might want, once again, if you've sat in on any of these, get out your paper and pencil, because you can take notes. Or this is being recorded. You can listen to it again and again and forever, I guess, um, maybe. I use the term bulbs as a generic term because some of the things we're going to look at are bulbs, like daffodils. Right. Or tulips, which we're not going to look at. But some are corms, which are totally different, uh -huh. like crocus. Yep. And some are um, tubers, like the Greek windflowers. Mm. And we're not going to look at any rhizomes. But they're all sort of brownish, and they are planted under groundish, <laughs> to make a rhyme. And usually they're planted in the fall, and they bloom the following spring. Not always, but in general. And, and usually their leaves disappear throughout the summer. So you don't know where they are if you somehow don't have a paper map that's saying, underneath this bare spot in July is where I planted a whole, you know, two square feet or something of, of my crocus or my right, daffodil. Right. Yeah. All righty. Um, now, we plant most of what we're talking about today. We're going to plant in the fall, which is now, and they're going to bloom next spring sometime. Um, with, I hate to say it, but it's true, with global warming, and here in Alford, up on my hill at 2,240 feet above sea level, my snowdrops sometimes bloom if they're on the east or south side of the house, mm. not in the woods or not on the north side. They will be blooming by late February. When back in the day, we didn't see ground until late March. I mean, we had snow cover four or five months out of the year, which is yeah. no longer true. Um, so there's some of these bulbs that bloom very, very early, from late February, let's say, on through May. So that's March, April, May, three months that we're going to be dealing with seeing beautiful bulbs, corms, tubers of one sort or another. So that's one thing. <clears throat> um, in general, well, maybe sh I should talk about the one thing that's not general first, and that's the snowdrops. Maybe okay. we, you, do you want to, maybe we should bring up the picture of the snowdrop at this point. Is that, I think it's the that, first one. Yeah. It's yeah, it looks first, like it. Yeah, number one. Let's see. Yeah. I can do it like this. I thought there was a more elegant way to do it. There we go. That's good enough. Okay. These are, of all the ones we're going to look at today, a bit unusual because they evolved in southern Europe, basically, mm. in the deciduous woods of southern Europe. And so they don't mind a more humusy, more damp soil to thrive in. And that doesn't mean soggy feet all year long, but they don't mind 
our climate here on the East Coast in the deciduous forests, which is what uh, we used to be before the white folks came along and cut it up, up most of it down. Um, so they live in dapple shade. Um, they will bloom without the sun coming out to shine. Um, we'll get to... Yeah, this looks like pine needles here. Those are probably... Um, I've planted them... Well, first of all, I got a clump that large filled my hands from Lynn Phelan. Some of you people may remember Lynn from years ago. He was in the 80s, lived in Almond, was a craft potter uh, from the area. And um, he was ill that year when I visited in the spring. And we sat in the backyard and there were thousands of oh, these oh, nice. uh, snowdrops all around. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a clump. And now I have probably a thousand. Mm -hmm. And Rima, where I gave Rima some a few years ago. Where did you put yours? They are up in at the very edge of a, a Norway spruce clump that okay. I have. All righty. So are they in total shade or mm -hmm. the sun sneaks no, in? No, the sun sneaks in. Okay. All righty. So, a little bit. Since they evolved in a forest that had sunshine in the early spring before the leaves came out mm -hmm. that's their ideal mm. environment okay. um but they do bloom in the shade or the semi-shade dappled east side west side whatever um and of course on a south side they'll bloom like two weeks ahead of if you planted them on the north side of your house or mm -hmm. or under the evergreens so i had them scattered around here and there um the interesting thing about these is and this is the reason you seldom see these for sale in the general box stores, the ideal time to transplant them is called, this is a very old fashioned phrase, I think, I'm guessing comes from England, in the green, which means as soon as they're done blooming in late, let's say March sometime, the flowers have faded, but the, but the leaves are gonna continue to grow for maybe six weeks. That's when you transplant them, when the leaves are still green in the spring, when the flowering is done because their um, bulbs are um, liable to very easily desiccated. So think of the box store, you know, okay. they dig them up and they dry them out and they put them in a box and then they put them in the warehouse. And then in the fall, they put them out on the shelves to sell. By then they're so dried out, they don't, aren't, aren't successful. Mm -hmm. So you, so either you have to go to um, possibly a specialty catalog company that deals just with bulbs, and there are those out there, or a reputable um, catalog in general gardening that knows how to take care of things, mm -hmm. or you find a friend mm -hmm. who wants to share mm -hmm. what they have. So anyway, I love snowdrops. There are several species, and the British can get very... <laughs> neurotic about this in that there are some people in mostly in England not only that will go to no lengths to find these rare subspecies hmm. and they will have a garden maybe with 10 different varieties hmm. of snowdrops but I'm not that fussy standing you know six feet in the air above them or five feet whatever it is they all pretty much I'm sorry, guys. They all pretty much look the same, <laughs> unless you're an expert. It's like the people with the tea and the wine, you know? Okay. So common snowdrops, and um, they do very well around here. And nothing bothers them. The deer don't eat them. The squirrels and the chipmunks and the rabbits leave them alone. Is that your experience? Yeah. yeah. And they increase and multiply, like the Bible says in the old days. Yeah. So start with a handful, and after 10 years, you will have... Unlike your uh, um, savings, <laughs> your stock <laughs> accounts, they will increase, continue to increase and multiply. So I'm getting off track here, but because they were different, um, I just wanted to mention that. However, almost everything else that we look at, the crocus, the daffodils, the other things we'll talk about, come from geography time. The eastern part of the Mediterranean. Think the island of Crete. Think mm -hmm. Turkey, Anatolia, mm -hmm. and on into Central Asia. Now, when something evolves in a certain place, that means it evolved in a certain climate. 
Right. And those of you who have tried to grow tulips here, for instance, it's, if the deer didn't eat them, the flowers, I, I once, no, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't me, it was somebody else, had a nice row of daffodils down their driveway. And the next morning they came out and every single flower was gone. Yeah, I yeah, believe it. Yeah, okay. But the main problem with tulips here still, even though I think they're trying to breed this out of them, is that they evolved in a place where, I think of California, you tend to have a rainy winter and sometimes it's quite cold, but not always. But then once spring is done, and, the, and late spring and summer and fall, it gets very hot and it gets very dry. So these bulbs, tulips in particular, like to have four, five, six months of a really dry ground around them. And when we don't have that, mm -hmm. which we usually don't, they kind of wither away mm -hmm. and die after like maybe three years. Mm -hmm. They just don't prosper. Now, if you are a tulip fanatic, and you are determined to grow tulips and you don't want to have to plant new ones every fall or every two years, what you could do is dig them up in late June, early June, when the leaves die down, dry them off, um, set them in sawdust or whatever it is with chips and keep them basically dry in a cool place and then replant them in the fall. Sorry, guys, that's for me, that's too much work. Mm -hmm. So you won't see any tulips in the rest of this show. So the, the most of these bulbs, not only do they like dry feet throughout at least half of the year in the summertime, which means good drainage. And everybody in Allegheny County, except if you live on one of those caves that the glacier left behind, pile of gravel. And there are a few places uh, closer to Almond that that's true. Um. You're going to have to do something about your drainage. And the easiest thing to do is, let's say you're going to start a new bed. Get rid of the sod. That means you've taken off at least two, three inches. Mm -hmm. Make sure you get rid of it all. There's nothing worse than trying to weed out sod in an ill-prepared bed. It's like spoiling the kid at age two. You're <laughs> going to regret it the rest of your life. Um so now say, say, and you've shaken out all the soil. So maybe you've re taken two inches off the roots. I would bring in six inches of sand. And I would work it into either with a tiller or with a spading fork into the, the remaining six inches of soil underneath the bit you remove from the top. So now you have a mix, six and six, half and half, sand and soil, but it's going to be four inches higher than the surrounding whatever, okay. lawn, patio, which is going to, so the sand is going to help with the drainage and the height, the raised bed is going to uh, help with the drainage. So that's what I did for, well, it's a combination herb, uh, crocus garden. Most of these except for a few, and I'll mention it when we look at the pictures, really do like full sun, right. which means probably eight hours a day. And why don't we switch then to the next, um, we'll look at some crocus. Now, those of you that grow crocus realize that most of them will not open out, up unless the sun is shining. And the reason they do this is because they bloom so early in the year, it's quite chilly. And you have frost, they, they will come, these are snow crocus or um, crocus species, wild crocus. Um, and they're smaller and they bloom earlier than the others we'll look at. Um, they need to protect their pollen from right. frost. So if it's cloudy, it's gonna be chillier or it's gonna be rainy. And they seem to know that they have their own weather report and the, the blossoms just don't open. Or if it's sunny in the morning and the blossoms, the petals open to um, expose the pollen to the bees mm -hmm. and then it clouds over, mm -hmm. it'll close right back up again. It's like an instant umbrella. Yeah. And the interesting thing, which is now unfortunately out of sync 
And one of those things that has happened with global warming is in the old days, and for me, that was 30, 40 years ago, when I first started my garden on the hill outside of Alfred, um, these snow crocus did not bloom until the third week in April or, the, or early in May. Depend, you know, every season is a little bit different. However, whenever they first bloomed, the honeybees were there. It was like the honeybees were waiting in their hive, also listening to the weather report. And their weather report was saying, well, it's just not, not ready yet. The crocus aren't open. It's not time for you to go out and start gathering up some more honey this year. It was amazing every year. And now what happens? Want to guess? The crocus are responding to the sunlight and the air temperature. And the bees are responding to something else, perhaps daylight. Oh. Or their hive, if it's in, in the woods in a tree, or the ground bees are in the ground, it's still cooler there. Mm. So they're on the old time schedule, not the new time schedule. And so it usually takes three or four or five days for the bees to show up. Anyway, um, mm. sunshine, good drainage. Um, some things we'll look at in a bit can tolerate um, part shade, but you won't get as much bloom. When we get to the daffodils, why don't you tell me what happened when you planted them, um, but not right now. Um, to fertilize or not to fertilize, to quote Hamlet. Um, my experience, because I have good soil, I hardly ever use commercial fertilizer or any, any kind of fertilizer. Um, I don't think most bulbs need it. Okay. However, if you're one of those people that just has to use fertilizer, then I would suggest a 10-10-10 nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and you apply it. Um, and once again, whatever the directions say, use half. Have you ever looked at chocolate chip cookie recipes? Mm -hmm. It depends on where the recipe comes from, how many chocolate chips you should add. And when you're reading the recipe on the package of chocolate chips, yeah. it's always more chocolate chips because oh, yeah. they want to sell chocolate yes. chips. The fertilizer people want to sell the fertilizer, guys. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. All right. Use half to a quarter of what they say. They say a cup or whatever. Use a half a cup or a quarter of a cup. And I would suggest using it twice a year. And when we get into a, a picture here in a little bit about how these things actually grow, um, because a lot of it's underground and you don't see it. Out of mind, uh, out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. All right. In early April or late March mm -hmm. would be some fertilizer scratched into the soil or in the fall, early October mm -hmm. when you're planting or scratching it into the soil around established beds. Now, the other thing that's interesting, um, which is why you can't really grow these things with your rhododendron and holly, because they like a very uh, neutral soil. Mm, okay. pH 7 to 7.5, which once again, normally Allegheny soil is mm, 6.8, 6.6. So here's where your wood ashes come in, or a little bit of lime. And once again, don't go willy-nilly, just toss it out there. Do a soil test first, okay? A soil test, uh, like tomorrow at the hardware store, or if you have your own kit, um, do it yourself, and then adjust as required. And once again, we're not talking about that, but sandy soil is different than a clay soil, than loam soil. It's amazingly, you know, how different the amount you have to add, depending on what kind of soil you have, as well as what its pH starting point is. Sounds like chemistry 101. Alrighty. If you're harassed by the deer and all those other little critters, mm -hmm. here's what you should grow. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> Daffodils okay. are poisonous. 
in all parts and nothing bothers them. So you don't have to worry about the deer eating the flowers or the leaves or the anything under the ground eating the bulbs. Isn't that lovely? Alrighty, almost deer, deer proof are uh, my snowdrops. We'll get to the squill and the chinodoxia. Oh, that's a, call it glory of the snow. Those also tend not to be, I've never had them bothered by anything. Tulips, on the other hand, which I don't grow, <laughs> are just, it's a big neon sign. Here I am, come and eat me up. So I don't bother with them. All righty. Um, now, when and how and where to plant. Um, now is the time. Do you have a soil thermometer by chance? No. Well, neither do I. Um, that's another whole talk. I don't know how to pronounce it, phenology, blah, 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 where you use nature as a thermometer to tell you what the temperature is in, especially in the spring. Huh. You've heard you plant your corn when the mouse's ear. Um, how big is the mouse's ear? I forget. But anyway, there's a whole bunch of those things. Or when the Physithia blooms, that's the time to put in da 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 da. Well, the fall is the same. Certain things happen, certain things bloom. As a matter of fact, at the end of this talk, if I ever get to it, we're going to look at some um, lilies. They're not bulbs, they're lilies called um, colloquium, I think is how, or uh, I'm bad at Latin. Some people call them fall crocus, but that's a mistake. Um, huh. They have just bloomed about a week ago. And so the soil has to be a certain temperature, and I think the daylight has to be a certain length, and then they bloom. Well, that's like having a thermometer telling you da 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 Okay, but if you have one of those thermometers and you stick it six or eight inches down into the ground, it gets cooler further down, right? When the soil temperature reaches about 50 degrees Fahrenheit is the time to start planting most of your bulbs. And we're not gonna go to the O2 level where we say which ones are, you know, at 50 and 55 or 45. We're just gonna say, about now, the end of September through probably the end of October, because our autumns in these last 10 years have gotten much extended mm -hmm. and warmer and um, sometimes dry like it, it used to be in the old days and sometimes not. But all of October is a pretty good time to plant because maybe right now, where that's that picture? Um, Hmm, this is kind of hard to see. So I am, you think that if we hold that up, they can see that or should I just talk it through? I'm gonna have to stop this, which I can do. Yeah, we'll be able to see. Okay, um, let me fold this then so we only see the one without confusing. Okay. Now this is true for many of the bulbs that we see um, why am I going there? Oh, because what I want you to do is, especially later in the month, you know how it is, you buy the bulbs and then somehow they don't get planted. <laughs> we all yes. do that, right? Yes. Um, you want to then mulch the soil four or five, six inches with something fluffy. But then in late February, take most of it off mm -hmm. because especially the smaller bulbs. If you have a six inch mulch on top, oh, forget yeah. it. They're not gonna be able to poke through. But that extra layer of insulation is going to keep the ground from freezing till Thanksgiving or maybe even Christmas. Yeah. And we need that because, now how, how do we hold this to show, show what we're doing? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Are they gonna be able to see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, uh, are they seeing this on their left? I'm seeing it on the right. What are they seeing it? Are they seeing it like I am? That's a good question. You know, I, yeah, I, noticed, like a that, mirror. I noticed that last time and thought, oh, how are people seeing it? Okay. Um, on what, on my screen, on the right side, towards the top is the, the crocus um, corm as you would purchase it at this time of year. It's just a little brown um, corm and you'd plant it three inches or so down. And within a week or two or three, it starts to set roots out of the bottom. Isn't it smart? 
<laughs> no, which way is down. And the beginning of the stem starts to poke up. But then it sits that way pretty much all winter. And then come March, let's say, is when the leaves pop up and the flowers bloom. And then what happens? Then in the next month, six weeks, the leaves begin to die down. And you're left with um, a new corm and little, little cormlets, I guess you call them, little babies around <laughs> the main one. Um, so it's this first two stages after you've planted it in the fall that you want to have the roots grow because without a good root system, mm -hmm. you're not going to get anything in the springtime to speak of. All righty. And then once your flowers have bloomed, the leaves are making food, storing it in the new corms mm -hmm. and babies for next year. So if you cut those leaves off, like you want to do with the daffodils, which we'll get to, or if you've planted them in your lawn and you're a lawn fanatic, oh, I'm using the adjectives really well this time, and you must mow your lawn two inches starting right away. Well, in a year or two, if you've planted daffodils or crocus or whatever in your lawn, they're gonna disappear because you've deep, you've starved them mm -hmm. of the ability to make food to store underground for the following year. So. That's the same with asparagus, isn't it? Like right now, my asparagus has all these tall, fluffy fronds and I'm leaving them so that they can continue to feed. Exactly, very good, roots. good. Asparagus, the general rule of thumb is you harvest for two, once it's established after three years. Right. Um, two months. So now it's May and June. And it used to be the 4th of July, traditionally. Like, you know, it was later in May that they started. And when, mm -hmm. then after the 4th of July, that was it. You let the roots, the crowns, make all these ferns, four feet, five feet high, to make food for once again. Because especially things that bloom early in the spring, they need stored food to do their thing. Mm -hmm. to make your asparagus or to make the flowers and if you kept harvesting probably next year you'd get very little right. and the next year you'd have nothing mm -hmm. right okay um where was i realizing okay so now we know when to plant um and and the fact that we're going to mulch several inches fluffy to keep the ground unfrozen for a while and then 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 how deep? Well, there's, where is it? Maybe it's on the other side of here. We're not gonna look, really look at this because it's simpler to simply say, come on, this is fourth grade math. You take your corn or your bulb and you set it upright. Usually you can tell which way is the top and which way is the bottom. And you say, hmm, now the corm is only, go or the snowdrops are only about an inch. That means the bottom has to go three inches down. So explain your wonderful tool that you use, Rima. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the hand bulb planter, which I saw somebody using, I think it was last year. And it not only will cut the soil for you, you just stick the whole thing in the ground. Let's see. I, I did get a picture. Oh, you got a picture? Okay. Yeah. Let's see a picture. Yeah, I can find the thing. Oh, I know what happened. I did not open it first. Okay. While she does that, so whatever, the smaller the bulb, the more shallow it goes into the ground. And so my snowdrops, my squill. There we go. Oh. Okay, hang on. It's like a donut cutter without the hole in the middle. Or a cookie cutter that just is a circle. Yeah. Except it has. It, and it's got these sharp edges at the bottom. Okay. It helps. So you, straight yeah. Down. You straight down. Yep. And then how, well, how do you get the soil out then? Just to, it comes out in a, a clod? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you had all sand, that wouldn't work. 
<laughs> but in clay you soil it but then i guess you could just and reach it, your hand down and, and, or the, scoop it out with the trout right, now, right are there inch marks on the side there are uh, yes so that tells you i'm going to go down three inches mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or let's say you have a nice um daffodil ball and it's two inches top to bottom then the bottom of the hole has to be six inches down so you need four inches clear of the bulb. Well, you don't think, just top. think, however high the bulb is, Okay. multiply it by three. Oh, okay. Two times three is six. The bottom of the hole has to be six or three times the height of the bulb. Is that fourth grade math? Maybe, maybe fifth or sixth, whatever. You all should know how to do that. Okay. Um, then how far apart do we put them? Well, that partly depends on aesthetics. It partly depends on how often am I going to have to dig these up and separate them out? Yeah. Because the closer you plant them together means the sooner you're going to have to dig them up and separate them out because they will increase and multiply mm -hmm. and pretty much right there. Mm -hmm. They don't, some self sow with seeds, but most of them just increase. Um, what is that? There's a word for it, and I forget. Where it doesn't have to do with making seeds, it's just um, offsets. Uh, anyway, um, then the flowering decreases because they get crowded, mm -hmm. and then the bulbs or the corn get smaller. So the suggestion is, if you do it right, most things will go for five years. Before you got to dig them all up and, and give away and whatever, spread them out. Okay. So the small things, they can be, I like maybe three inches apart. Anything that's little, three inches apart. Okay. And I usually don't do rows. We'll get to that in a minute, style. But just say, say a circle or an oval or a tear shape. Some people say, Take a handful and go, boom, toss them. And wherever they fall, plant them. That's a more natural approach. Okay. With the bigger things like the daffodils, I would set them eight inches apart to begin with. Now that means for the first year or two, you're going to, and, and I do it in clumps. And I don't know where this came from. Maybe the Japanese, you plant in odd numbers. Three, five, seven, nine. You don't plant two, four, six, eight. Now, I'm sure people can argue about that. But anyway, I do the odd numbers. So for daffodils, it might be um seven or something. You know, you, you do you do want a, a presence. You have to have a quorum of a certain number of bulbs. And I do about eight inches apart. So uh, and once again in sort of a circle or an oval or in a slightly odd shape and then they can stay put for five or six years before mm -hmm. you got to do it over again um okay what else before we go on to our pretty pictures now when i'm thinking about if i were doing this all from scratch what would i buy I look for trouble free, which means I'm not going to do daffodils because I have a lot of deer around and I'm you not tulips. feeding. Yeah. What did I say? Daffodils. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm not hitting on daffodils. No. Okay. Tulips. I don't do tulips because they're too much trouble. Um, well, you don't get to see them either because the deer come along. And and they do. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Then maybe you want to um, certain species naturalize better than others and i remember driving to albany once on the old main drag whatever that was before the the four the three-way came through albany and as you come into albany oh like 10 miles out big beautiful houses along what used to be the main four lane into town and it was springtime once and it was on the uh, south side of the road and he probably had a half acre lot you know maybe 100 feet wide on the sidewalk, 200 feet deep in the house. And the whole side yard, blue Siberian iris. Mm -hmm. Just just blue everywhere. <laughs> and I thought, 
Wow. The only way to do that is to be very rich <laughs> and buy a million bulbs and plant them or wow. live there for a hundred years and let nature do the planting for you. Mm. So certain things will, um, and we'll, when we look at the individuals, we will say which ones are best. We'll, there's two ways. Some actually self-sow with seeds and some by offsets. And they just take over eventually. Um, all right, a few more points before we can look at our pictures. After they bloom, you have to wait at least six weeks for the leaves to die back naturally if you want to keep your plants healthy and blooming next year. Um, so for me, I plant my daffodils behind my perennial flower row bed because as the, they begin to wither and die, my perennial flowers are coming up in front of them and they're not as noticeable. They're not right there in your face. Um, and I don't grow, mow my lawn that religiously anyway. So the fact that maybe when it gets six inches high, I run the mower at six inches so that I cut off, I keep the lawn a bit under control for the month of May, but it allows the leaves to, of the crocus, say, or whatever it is to keep on growing. Right. Yeah. All righty. Um, now. Daffodils, this is kind of something nobody knows. What happens with sunflowers, Rima, when they're, they're, you know, they start to bloom? What do sunflowers do? Face the sun. They face the sun, which means in the morning they're looking east and then to the south, it's like a clock. And then in the evening they're to the west until they've been pollinated and then they tend to hang upside down to save the seeds from getting too wet. Daffodils also face the sun. So let's say it's winter time and you've got out your paper, graph paper and your pencils and you're planning your new border and you've decided just daffodils. I'm going to have eight weeks of daffodils and I can do this by the variety of species. And I want to be able to sit in April when it rains a lot at my breakfast table with my coffee and look out my window <laughs> and see my daffodils. <laughs> Now, if that window faces north and your border of daffodils is to the north of that window, then yes, you will see your beautiful daffodils because they'll be facing towards you, which is towards the south. But <laughs> if your window's on the other side of the house, then you're going to see the backsides mm -hmm. of your daffodils. Hmm. Hmm. So that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. Sorry, you got to dig up all your daffodils. <laughs> the other thing is most early blooming daffodils, let's say the ones that bloom in April, are yellow. To be followed usually by the white blooming ones mm -hmm. in May. So once again, if you're going to plant in the woods, and now our woods are leafing out earlier than they used to, I would put yellow daffodils in the woods because chances are they'll bloom when there's still plenty of sunshine and you'll get plenty of flowers. And then there is style and that's all personal. Some people like order, right angles, straight rows, round circles. Think of Williamsburg. Is that it, Williamsburg down in Virginia? Um, when the French way of gardening, the French formal was very the in thing to do. You see lots of squares and rectangles, straight lines, et cetera, et cetera. I do think certain of these bulbs lend themselves to that better than others. And I think tulips are one and hyacinth are another, both of which I don't grow. Well, I do grow the dwarf hyacinth but um, not the big, bigger mm -hmm. ones. Um, or the more natural style, which England sort of developed um, in beginning in the late 1700s, where it's more informal, more curvy, more natural. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that, you know, that's, that's up to you. <laughs> oh. 
All right. Picture time. Finally, what time is it? I think we've rambled. I've rambled. It's 1220. Really? 1220? We're not going to get to harvesting. Well, <laughs> okay, let's look at the picture. There go, right there. All righty, we've seen this we've one. We've seen let's, that one. Okay, right. let's move on. We have a few um, snow croak. Um, these are all snow crocus is the common name, but they're different species. And they've all been bred from the wild. Oh, probably over a century. So we have a variety of colors that we can choose from. Usually whites, lavenders, mm -hmm. cream colors, and yellow mm -hmm. are the, the basic colors. And they all like sunshine. They all like good drainage. So let's move on. We just talked about a few others. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I love the I love this color, the, the purple fading to the pale in the middle. Mm -hmm. And um, nice. it's fairly common out there, fairly easy to find. The next one, I um, let me, where, where are my notes here? Okay. Oh, there's the snow crocus. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that looks um, different. It, it is different. And it's, um, unfortunately, I don't have the, the it might be Byzantium, the, the Latin part of the name. Mm. And it is an heirloom, heirloom, heirloom. It was first domesticated, you know, dug up in the wild, probably somewhere in Anatolia, Turkey, mm. and Crimea in 1587. So it's been around for a long time. Cloth of gold is another nickname for it, oh, I believe. Nice. Yep. So if you like yellows, there's maybe one for you. And what's my next one? The Ruby Giant. Okay. Now which are not ruby colored. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, you're right, but they do have a reddish tinge to the purple. This, how do you pronounce that? Let's call them Tommies because that's what the British call them. <laughs> this um, species yeah. is and variety is very popular in England and they call them Tommies and they come in all shades of lavender and purple and they self-sew like crazy. Mm. So they will, and they, they also do better in dapple shade than others so that's when you might and ruby giant also has been out there for a few years okay what's next ah now Joan we, of Arc. <laughs> oh yeah i forgot that okay but see the second part Olinaeus. remember he had two parts the family and the mm, uh -huh. mm, Species, right? Genus and the species. Yeah. I get them mixed. Yeah, genus and species. Yeah. The Vernus crocus once again come from Europe rather than Central Asia or Anatolia, and they're bigger and they're a little later. You and you, these are usually the ones you see on the market in the mm. box stores, especially. Um, and I have two kinds: a white one and a purple one. So here we have the Joan of Arc. And they're a bit, they're probably twice as big as the snow crocus, the earlier one, and they're three weeks later. So around the middle of April. Now, I, a few years back, I decided I wanted in my lawn to grow, and I got a bunch of um, snow crocus. But they bloom so early, the grass still wasn't green. And somehow it just wasn't in my mind's eye beautiful mm -hmm. the color against mm -hmm. the dead grass so my suggestion is if you want to grow crocus in your lawn grow the venus varieties the purples and the whites because they will be blooming when your grass is beginning to turn green and i think mm, yeah. the green grass makes a nicer backdrop Ta -da. okay ah here we have um i always call them squill officially the latin is scylla Siberica. Well, that's Siberian. And if anything wasn't, this is the best name for something because they are zone two. Zone two, which means 50 below. <laughs> so when we used to live in, uh, you know, zone four, which once in a blue moon got down into the low 20s below, um, these just were just happy. <laughs> they were in the tropics as far as their origins were concerned. Now, these are if you could see mm, squint squint the blue bells hang upside down uh -huh. they only grow about six inches high and they're right behind the crocus so middle of april or so and they do quite well in the deciduous woods 
Um, but um, but um, but um, do, uh, nothing seems to bother them. Hmm. Um, most of them are blue. You can find, I think, a white variety and maybe a darker blue or a paler blue, hmm. but they're generally blue, blue, blue. So next. Now this is kind of rare and I happen to um, find it in a nursery down when I used to visit my friends in State College. And there was a, a really nice nursery that really had a lot of wildflowers. And they did, weren't actually selling this. It was part of a display, you know, um, I don't know, 50 feet by 50, where they had a lot of things growing under the trees. Yeah, it's really pretty. But she did clump up for me. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice. Pushkinia, it's a, a Russian um, botanist or whatever discovered this 100 or so years or whatever years ago, somewhere, I think, in, in Russia, I mean, Ukraine. And um, it's a pale, I can't quite tell if it's a pale, pale, pale blue with a blue vein, or if it's really white with the blue vein, and then that gives it that blue glow. So. Now, but the bees like that too. Is there a bee in there? No, but oh. I was just the envisioning yeah. a bee, you know, looks very inviting to it. Five years ago now, I think, seven of them. And so I, I spread them out right at the north end of my asparagus bed by the path that goes through my garden. Mm -hmm. And they have doubled each year. Mm. Never had trouble with the deer until last year. And they had all come up like 21 of them. They're about six, eight inches high. And I thought, oh, I'm going to take a picture tomorrow. And I went out tomorrow. <laughs> and they'd been all eaten. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Yeah. So now I just lay a uh, a screen like a yep. Hudson Hut screen over yeah. them. Yeah. Okay. What's next? I have to do that with a lot of things. Uh huh. Okay. Glory of the snow. Chinodoxa, if that's how you pronounce it. Uh, in many ways, similar to the squill. However, they're up facing, mm -hmm. and they have a white center, which I think is quite neat. And once again. They're usually in a variety of shades of blue, some darker than others. I think there might even be a pink one, but so, and once again, they're early, middle of April. Okay, now I think maybe, what's next? Ah, my windflowers, um, I don't know mm -hmm. Now these are the tubers. And whenever you get tubers, the suggestion is you soak them in lukewarm or room temperature water for a day, 24 hours before you plant them. Mm. The other potential problem is it's this brown knobby thing. What's up and what's down? And sometimes it's hard to tell. Sometimes there'll be a few little dry roots. Sometimes it's a bit um, convex on the bottom, concave, dipped on the top. Um, but they say, plant if you really can't tell, put them in sideways oh. and they will figure it out mm. and write themselves up eventually as they grow. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, <laughs> how do they do that? <laughs> I think it has something to do with the roots and tension, but I'm not sure. Um, what the other, oh, the interesting thing about tubers, I believe it's true for these as well as cyclamen, which I don't believe we're going to look at. Most cyclamens we buy for the winter and they're tender, but there's one or two varieties that you can plant outdoors and I have, but they didn't last forever. Hmm. Um, that are zone five hardy. They're also tubers. The way you get more flowers is that every year the tuber gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger it doesn't make babies it just gets bigger and bigger and makes more flowers mm -hmm. interesting so these are the windflowers from uh, crete first mm. discovered when they, the archaeologist what his name i forget in the 1850s tromping around crete looking for ancient civilizations oh god yes yeah I what's it that. um Give me a choice and I can remember his name, but I can't pull it out of my me head. Me either. I know who it is too. Yeah. Anyway, um, also in the whole peninsula there. And they are beautiful. Mix of white and blues and yucky mauves. So <laughs> I tend to weed out 
you know, when I got a mix, I didn't like the pink color. It just wasn't a good color. But I have a few pale blue. And then this was a special hybrid almost um, called Splendor, I think. And it's white and it's a little bit bigger. Oh, okay, we got to move on or we're never going to get done. What's that? Ah, the spring snowflake. We don't see that often, but I have a woodland garden and I have a, one bed is quite damp. This is one bulb that will grow in the shade, semi-shade, deciduous woods, in a damp spot. And it blooms, when does it bloom? Late May, I think. And it gets quite high, a good 12, 18 right. inches high. And it looks like snowgrass. Yeah. But it's bigger and it's a different species. Okay. Are we finally to our daffodils? <gasps> yes. Okay. Oh, Narcissi. Well, Narcissi is the official name, but we all call them daffodils or daffy down dillies or whatever. Um, by the way, King Alfred is dead. What they sell nowadays as King Alfred is not the original mm -hmm. King Alfred. It's the grandson or the great nephew or the whatever. Mm -hmm. Looks very similar, but genetically is not the same. Mm -hmm. and for some reason, who I don't know, maybe it happened during the war. I don't know. It, they, it died out or they didn't keep it going or whatever. Wow. So anyway, what we see now is um, other similar varieties. Okay, let's move along here so we can see them all. Ta -da. This is a very popular, uh, fairly new variety, Ice Follies, which is very sturdy, fairly early blooming, about six inches, 16 inches tall, mainly white with a pale yellow, oh, okay. Think back to the King Alfred. That's called a trumpet oh, right. daffodil because the trumpet is fairly long. And once again, what are these? Corinth? I forget. I'm sorry. I'm not good at Latin. We call them petals. But there's a whole nother class of um, large cone, I think they're called, where it is a trumpet, but it, it's not that long a trumpet, uh -huh. but it's wider. And that pale, pale, sort of a lemony yellow will fade, you know, like in a week's time as the flower gets older till it's almost all creamy white. Okay, what's next? Now, here is a small cup yeah. daffodil, which I really do like. Yeah. And it, yeah. it's quite white, a very tiny cup, which is mostly yellow with a little red band. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, very pretty. I mean, I must. I fall into the same problem as those people in England that love their um, snowdrops. <laughs> Except there are more daffodil varieties, and this one I really love. I love the name. It's an intermediary as far as size of the trumpet, but it is. It's just such a lovely white color. Yeah, it really it's is. a very, 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 very pale green eye. You could, they say in the in the center there. I, you see, I tend to like the white ones. And goose green is another lovely one, but once again, a very small um, okay, cup um, that's mostly this pale yellow. Do all daffodils have six petals? Yes. I just never really paid attention, but it's really clear here. You can really see it. Unless now they've done some messing around with the breeding in the petri dish, and now you have daffodils that are doubles, Over like peonies. Yes. Uh, Tulips have been yeah. Named. yeah, but that's not normal. That's okay. not Mother Nature. That's the lab. Ah, okay. Now I think we have reached something that's not spring bulbs, which is our main topic that we've gotten carried away on. These are, coach, I don't know. You you can pronounce it. Um, some people call them uh, fall crocus, but that's not true. They are a lily. I'm almost certain. Once again, six petals. And yeah. this just bloomed um, about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago at the earliest. Um, but you see there are no leaves, are there? Which means, and these are good size. These are good three, four inches what? in diameter. Oh. And when they're closed up, about four inches high, like a, a trumpet, a cup, mm -hmm. and then they open in the sun. But on my windy hill, with no support, they flop over. Oh, yeah. So what I've tried to do, and I still haven't succeeded with these, obviously, 
is to underplant them with something like purple alyssum or something that would give them support. Back the support, yeah. Yep, and then the flowers would sit on top of mm. this three inch. Okay. Wow. Um, now their leaves come up in the spring, and they're a good foot high. Okay, wait a second. Back up. Let me back up. Yeah, a good foot high, maybe eighteen inches high even, and a good two inches wide. And there they are, just a blob of green leaves, which then once again, you have to let die down. Yeah. So they can be a mines or, or whatever. However, that's the way it goes. And that's also the way it goes with our true fall crocus. I had a lady once saw this talk and said, oh, I, I'm going to have these lavender fall crocus. And so she bought them and planted them. And next spring, the leaves came up, no flowers. Hmm. She called me up. What did I do wrong? There are no flowers. I said, well, what was it did you buy? And she mentioned, and I said, oh, those are the fall crocus. She said, yes. I said, but they don't bloom in this. All they do is like make leaves in the spring. Don't pick them up. They're not whatever. Just wait. Yeah. Wait. And then once again, though, in the fall, just like the colchium, mm. just the flowers. Uh -huh. So in this case, I'm pretty sure however you pronounce that that's a lovely lovely lavender and the anthers the male part are white really interesting mm -hmm. it's hard to see on the 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 clump that i and they were iffy on temperature i was pushing the zone and the clump in the garden died off but somehow two feet out in the lawn <laughs> this one clump pops up every fall and blooms out in the grass and the weeds but the ones that um, are more common, next one, are the, uh-oh, I forgot about them. Oh, they're cyclamen. Well, that's when I had the, my cyclamen, but, um, and they were in the front rock garden by the front door, and they bloomed every mm, late September into October. Mm. And then the leaves lasted usually till Thanksgiving, and then they disappeared. Then they reappeared, if I remember, no, they, I think they lasted over the winter. And then in early spring, the leaves died down, disappeared, and it just sat there through the summer. Huh. Um, but it really, it was, once again, pushing the zone oh. and the conditions. Mm -hmm. And after three or four years, it died out. Mm -hmm. So I, let, I tried again in the woods, but it didn't work. So I let it go. Okay. So anyway, there we go. Ooh, all righty. I'm a pretty little guy. And what's this? Do you recognize what it's sitting in? <laughs> no, I was looking at that thinking, okay, what is that? It looks really familiar. Sweet listen. Oh, okay. Which to me was a perfect match because I could plant the sweet listen in the, in the spring right after the leaves died down. Well, transplant. I always start them early or dig them up where they self-sowed. And then by uh, September, it was blooming at about what? Maybe four inches high. So once again, this makes leaves in the spring. But then in the fall, it just sends up this uh -huh. fragile flower with no support. Yeah. And then the last slide would be another one. Hmm. And it really sort of self-sewed itself into my dianthus i think that's a dianthus plant there um which is okay now sort of although i'm fussy about things being in their place but in the spring it's a pain because all the leaves shoot up <laughs> right and you don't want to cut them back no no because if you cut them back then you don't get any flowers right well are we we must be out of time are we out of time we are how much are we over 10 minutes oh, really sorry guys but we didn't even get to the other half, which was harvesting our vegetables. So that'll be next time, along with what? Let me find it. All righty, so we'll have to cover harvesting, cleaning up the garden. Mm. Do we spade or do we not spade? Mm. Um, but we should, especially if you've never done it or if it's a new garden, raise the beds or the row we'll talk about how to do that and then the compost pile so somehow we'll cram all of that into <laughs> next time all right all righty
Do we know if anybody listened in today? Hello there, whoever you are. Hello.